Welcome back to KC Cares, Kansas City's window on the nonprofit community and the people they serve. I'm Ruth Bombigas. We want to once again thank the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation for underwriting KC Cares and giving us the opportunity to share all these fabulous stories from the nonprofit community of Kansas City. Over 11,000 organizations out there helping people better lives, better lives, better community. A new organization came to our attention, and I'm so excited that we have the opportunity to sit down with the Restoration House and Kim Case. Yes, good morning. Welcome, Kim. And you are Executive Vice President of Operations. Yes, Ruth, that is true. Does that mean somebody calls you when a toilet doesn't work? That does fall under my purview, (laughs) yes. (laughs) Lucky, lucky you. Kansas City, unfortunately, has become well-known for something I don't think we want to be well-known for, and that is kind of being at a crossroads of human and sex trafficking. Yes, Ruth, we are. And Restoration House is working to help with that. But tell us a little bit about what the situation is here and why are we the ones that have these huge numbers of of victims? It is tragic, but... The exciting thing today that we're going to talk about is the hope that can be found and offered to these survivors of sex trafficking. Unfortunately, Kansas City has risen as a hub, and according to a study done by Arizona State University, uh, we fell into that category due to the numbers of those that are being exploited and trafficked here, and also due to the amount of vulnerable youth and teens that that are residing in this area, and also due to the regional location where we are in the Midwest. Were that crossroads? Is that what causes these numbers to be so great? It's an indicator and a contributor, certainly. Uh, Also, we have had some really strategic and powerful law enforcement forces and court systems that have taken this issue on and proactively really worked to offer services and kind of take a dent into this crime. So it's become um, something that the public has become aware of because of the efforts of our stakeholders and our, our partners. Can you give us some numbers? What is it like here? And and exactly who are we talking about as victims? Sure. The numbers are a little bit of a moving target still today because this crime is fairly new in being identified really up until 2000. We didn't have laws in Missouri or across the country identifying this crime. So this exploitation that was occurring was falling into other categories. So we've been working to really tighten up the way that we identify these situations and then also make statistics around them. So globally, there are about 40 million people enslaved in some sort of trafficking either labor or sex trafficking. But the United States is second in sex trafficking numbers, uh, second only to Germany. Now that's surprising to me. I don't know why, but that just seems surprising. And let's, can we define the two terms? You have sex and human trafficking. Are they different or does one encompass the other? Sure. Great question. Human trafficking is kind of the umbrella term that takes into account any forms of trafficking, like labor trafficking, where someone is um, exploited through a work process, not paid fairly, uh, identification documents taken, things like that. Maybe they don't have uh, access to language that we do here, and so they're not able to to ask for those fair practices or know that, that they deserve that. Additionally, sex trafficking has, has really shown itself as prostitution and what we have always looked at as someone that is choosing and perpetrating this lifestyle when in fact we have learned about the vulnerabilities that occur uh, oftentimes from birth onward that have left these individuals, men and women, without choice and it's more about making a decision to survive in the moment and so um, they have found themselves exploited uh, in sex practices, um, in trading sex for money, drugs, rent, home, things like that. And that's kind of how it's perpetrated to the sex trafficking. So we have human trafficking that is the overarching uh, epidemic and then kind of the categories, if you will, of labor and sex trafficking. Restoration House. What are you? So how do you fit into this this whole mix of this really huge problem? Right. Our name says it all. It's, it's a wonderful 
way to be each day when you know that you can impact people through providing restorative services. And to these individuals, men, women, boys and girls, what often has been missing in their life is someone to believe in them and someone to show them that they deserve to have a different story in life. So foundationally, we exist to provide a home, a stable home, hope, and the belief that they deserve to have a second chance. And so uh, we surround them with love and, and through that access to all kinds of programming that enables them to redefine who they'd like to be have access to see healthy relationships and restorative uh, services and programs to begin to unlearn some of the patterns and systems that have been ingrained in them due to abuse and neglect and relearn some things that can give them a hope for the future. How do folks get to you? How do you find them? Do you go out on the street and, and hang out at 435 in Medcap, which I understand is a tremendous um, spot? It is. We actually do uh, a variety of services to, to reach out to those. Uh, again, most of our referrals come in through systems that are, are set in place like Homeland Security, the FBI, when they do operations and things like that. We are um, connected to networks of those that are out doing outreach on the streets and also to other service providers that give us referrals and help us to bring those that um, would be a good fit into the folds of Restoration House. How many folks are living there now? We are so excited to announce that we have recently been gifted some farm property uh, south of the Kansas City metro. And so we uh, are remodeling a, a home that's on the site and a life and activity center and the church and office space. So we have been serving up to 20 um, as, as they've moved in and out of our services, some living in independent living and uh, help us helping them process through other resources that are available. We're just about to reopen our home there on mm -hmm. this farm property for Restoration Farms, and I expect that to happen by the beginning of the year. And that'll allow you... There will be seven survivors on site there, and additionally, we have a home for minor girl survivors of sex trafficking that is soon to open tomorrow, as a matter of fact, in... Uh, I'm sorry, the name, Peculiar, sorry, the name just slipped right on my mind, in Peculiar, Missouri, and we are partnering with Missouri Baptist Children's Home to provide those specialized services to minor survivors. Minors, that just, unbelievable that, that that's an issue. The average age of entry into a prostitution situation or exploitation is the age of 12. Oh. So there are so many vulnerabilities that our youth face these days, and there are traffickers out seeking to groom and, and find them and recruit them through social media or just due to the fact that they may not have support systems at home that keep them safe and keep them grounded in healthy families. Do you all do any kind of outreach programming to the community to, to educate on this issue? We do. We have a robust group of volunteers, and we have an executive director of community outreach that gets out to really share the message of hope that we have. We work through all different kinds of organizations to, to bring in those that might want to volunteer and, and offer support services through us, through mentorship and things like that. And then additionally, a nice network of uh, businesses and churches that we share the message and the need of outreach and education. If folks want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to take advantage of some of these educational opportunities? Sure. Reach out to our website, which is restorationhousekc.com. You can find all of our contact information there. Uh, we love visitors to the farm, and we also are about to open a coffee shop in Greenwood, Missouri. That's what you mentioned. Tell us more about this coffee shop. It's yes. kind of a dual-purpose place for you. It is, Ruth. It is called Rehope Market and Cafe, and we will offer the roastery coffee, which is amazing, and we love that, and uh, different pastries and sandwiches and salads. So you can come, enjoy coffee, do a little work, and know that all of your time and your resources spent there will be contributing to the support and survival of survivors. So we will offer this as a, as a third stage kind of opportunity for work site experience, also understanding how business works and things like that. And then the coffee shop proceeds will 
go back into the mission of our work and support the services. So it's twofold. Uh, everyone on site there and the staff has a heart for this cause and a heart to serve. And so it's a really exciting, neat place. And that will open officially on November 16th on Saturday. So you can go out and grab a cup of coffee. If folks want to come out and tour, they can just get in touch with you as well if they want to see firsthand the kind of work that you're doing. Absolutely. We invite visitors to the farm. We, we believe that it is imperative for us to show community and healthy relationships to our survivors, uh, both adults and children. We really want to show how we all interact and, and relate in a healthy way so that can be a ground stone for them to understand what life can be like. Can you give us a little bit of the history of how this all started? Sure. Um, there were several uh, men and women that had a heart for this cause, and they saw the epidemic that was happening across the country and across the world. And they began to research and see what services were available in Kansas City and where the gaps were. And the Blue Rivers ba Baptist, Baptist Association uh, formed an, an organization, a nonprofit, to begin making an impact in this epidemic. And the need quickly arose for housing and a safe place for survivors to live. Sure. And from there, it has just been uh, a wonderful opportunity to bring people into the fold to support this need. Is there a story you can share of someone that you all have brought in and kind of their journey and maybe where they are now, although we want to protect their their information. We don't want them to fall into harm's way again. Sure, absolutely. I think uh, one of the more recent things that have impacted me is the light that I saw in someone's eyes when they realized that they actually were learning the skills to support themselves, be independent, and have a life that they could contribute back, and they could be a neighbor. And so as we were working to transition this particular client into some independent living um, quarters, just the fact that she saw the love that other people were pouring into her and what she had learned about life and managing bills and budgets and understanding that she had what she needed and had the hope and belief in herself really to, to make a difference in life from here forward. And I think just the light in her eyes helps me to understand that one person can make a difference and one person can change lives. And so that's what this organization is about, one-to-one -one offering support, love, and encouragement. What's your journey with the organization? How did you come to, to be in this kind of work? Sure. I joined the team of Restoration House of Greater Kansas City in August. I've been working in nonprofit and as a consultant across the, the country, serving in the area of, of victimization. As a survivor of crime myself in the 90s, I learned that there were a lot of gaps in the way that the criminal justice system treated victims of crime and so set about a journey to um, channel all the, the angst and the hurt um, and the grief and loss into something that could maybe change the path for others. So I've been working through the criminal justice system and other nonprofits to close those gaps and serve survivors and give them dignity and respect as they move through the criminal justice system. So this is personal for you, not necessarily the crime that that's committed, but yes. you've been down this path. Yes, I think when you find yourself at a place where hope seems elusive, you know that you're still alive, you're still on this earth, maybe there's a purpose, but it's hard to find the hope. And when someone comes alongside you, like I had done for me, and, uh, and you realize that there can be a different story, that defined and inspired me to want to give back and want to share that with other people who maybe didn't have a voice for a variety of reasons. So it's a very personal journey. All of the things that I've learned about working within the systems and helping develop programs and things. I'm so excited to bring to Restoration House so that those professionals, we have an amazing team of people that have dedicated their lives to impacting this situation, to join them and to, to work towards remedying this together in this area is, is an honor. How lucky they are to have you though, well, because you. you've got that internal sense and drive having walked a walk uh, not necessarily in, in the human trafficking, but having experienced a system and, and difficulties yes. and surviving it. Yes. And, and now you are an example for the folks that you work with. We all know there's great causes out there, but by golly, running a house costs money. So how does Restoration House do this financially? 
Yes, we partner with a variety of types of givers and donors that really want to make an impact. And, and so we have reached out to foundations and corporations. We are really looking to diversify with some state funds and federal funds that are available uh, through Congress to impact this issue, but also to have people come alongside us that uh, are willing to donate time or in-kind type things of work skills. And so that's how we can make this work. We really trust in the path set before us. We trust that this um, that this issue will be remedied through the hard work and dedication of, of people in the community. So we are uh, looking for ways to, to partner and to bring an opportunity to really change lives. I think it's exciting when I can go in and meet with folks in a boardroom or sit down with uh, those that a church or a, a business that might want to partner and just explain the opportunity for life change. And I think people want to get aboard and, and be able to do that. Tackling human sex trafficking, the Restoration House, you are a beacon out there for folks in the community. So thanks for all you do and for sharing it with us on Casey Cares. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you for listening to KC Cares, Kansas City's nonprofit digital resource. We're produced by Charitable Communications, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. KC Cares is generously underwritten by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. And a shout out to one of our benefactors, Jeffrey Byrne, for our great KC Cares coffee mugs. KC Cares podcasts are available on our website, kccaresonline.org. And if you want to be a guest, Go to our website, fill out that form. We'd love to have you on the show. You can spread the love and find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at KC Cares Online. Thank you for listening to KC Cares on ESPN 1510 AM and 94.5 FM. And thank you, Kansas City Library.